Welcome everybody to this study of the Godhead. And uh, last week we ended up actually after the class dealing with more matters on the omniscience of God or God being all knowing, knowing that's the uh, all that's the object of knowledge. And I thought I would spend a little more time on that and and go back over some of what I did last week. Um, let me look here just a second and see where I want to get started. Um, we have spoken about uh, God's omnipotence. We've mentioned that he is immutable, means he doesn't change. Now, don't get that confused with the fact that he, in, in unfolding the scheme of redemption in time for us, then, of course, it looks like patriarchal age changed and the then the mosaical age changed into what we have the christian age but that's just revelation it was always in the mind of he who knows all things so uh, don't get that confused with saying well god changed no he didn't uh, he is what he is great i am eternal he does not change his attributes don't change they're eternal and they flow from the essence of his being that one essence is the one God in three persons or three persons and one God. So then we talked a little bit about the matter of the omniscience of God. And that means uh, that he knows whatever is possible to know. Sometimes you hear it said, you may have heard me say it. He knows all that's the object of knowledge. And that he knows all of what is possible to know. Let me give you a couple of well, for more than a couple of scriptures on it. First Samuel 2 and verse 3. I'll give you time to write these down. First Samuel chapter 2, verse 3. First Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Job chapter 36, verses 4 and 5. Job 36, verses 4 and 5. In the New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 18. Acts 15, verse 18. And then another one in the Old Testament, and these aren't all of them, but another one is Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. So omniscience means that he uh, comprehends all things. Now, we would talk about past, present, future. So to accommodate us, we would say he comprehends all things in the past, the present, the future. But there is no past, present, future as far as God's concerned. That just fits the way he made us because in time, there is a past, present, future. But remember, God made time. and you know, He can work in time, and he's not governed by time. But as he deals with man the way he made man, where he put man, then he must deal with man as those things require, things actual and things possible. Um, he has universal and complete knowledge. So let me give you a number of other scriptures concerning what they say about omniscience or God knowing all that is the object of knowledge. Divine omniscience is knowledge without the discovery of facts previously unknown. Now, you see, when we study, we study for facts that we didn't know when we learned them. From Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13 through 14, we see that being that he is omniscient and he knows all that's the object of knowledge, so he doesn't have to go learn something like you do or I do. You might want to write down Romans chapter 11, verses 34 through 36. Romans 11, 34 through 36, and Acts 15, 18. So divine uh, omniscience is knowledge which is complete. In other words, nothing can surprise God. Sometimes we're surprised at what we learn, but nothing happens like that with God because there's nothing he doesn't know. 
So this knowledge that omniscience is all inclusive. What does that mean? Well, it means he knows every possible variation of anything, all contingent elements of everything, and the relation things have to one another. So God knows what from eternity past, as we would talk about it, because we're in time, and uh, we'll be in eternity future, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, and Acts 15, 18. He just knows it. He knows everything in nature. Psalm 147, 4. Matthew 10, verse 29. Psalm 147, 4. Matthew 10, verse 29. Sometimes when you're sitting on your back porch or somewhere where you can relax and you're looking out at nature, just give a general observation of what's going on out there. And whatever you can see, moving around, whatever flowers there, whatever's happening. Just know that I don't flow, that all flowed out of the mind of God. And I stand amused when I, uh, not only amused, but absolutely amazed when I look at things and see the design of them, and the colors of them, the intermingling of colors and the way things work and the various bugs doing what they do <laughs> and yet all of that was in the mind of god remember not a sparrow falls that he doesn't know even the very hairs of your head are numbered that's just a very quaint way of saying there's nothing he doesn't know he knows all the ways of all men proverbs 5 21 proverbs 5 21 psalms 139 verses 2 through 4 Psalms 139, verses 2 through 4. Then Amos chapter 9, verses 2 through 4. Amos 9, 2 through 4. So as Paul wrote to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy uh, 2 and verse 19, he knows those who are his, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. He knows his children's sorrows. Exodus 3, verse 7. Exodus 3, 7. Now, let's pause here a minute and mention something about that. When, uh, before, let me put it this way, before the second person of the Godhead, the eternal word became flesh, that is, he became man, John 1, 1 and 2 and 14, then because God knows all that the object of knowledge, that he, he knew the sorrows, but it's until he became a man he did not experience those sorrows. So I've got to know the difference in objectively knowing a thing without experiencing it. But when Christ, the second person of the Godhead, became man, then he experienced the things that we experience as human beings. It didn't every point like as we are yet without sin. So he knows what it's like to suffer because you love the truth and want to live by it. He knows what it's like to live in the flesh. He knows our needs. Matthew 6, 8, and 32. Matthew 6, 8, and 32. I don't know that I gave you one of the believer's sorrows, but Exodus 3, 7 will be a good one for that. Because he, before the son became incarnate or was incarnate in the flesh, the eternal word, he still knew the burdens and the sorrows of the children of Israel not in Egypt. Then when he became a man, of course, God knew experientially what those sorrows were and the, what the needs of a believer are because he was living as a man. He knows all about the details of a life, of my life, your life, all other people's lives. Matthew 6, 8, and 32. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, verse 32. Uh, that covers the believer's needs. That ver those verses do. Matthew 6, 8, 32. The details of life that I mentioned. Matthew 10, verse 30. Sometimes we get the idea, oh, nobody understands. Nobody really knows like I know. 
Well, maybe among men that might be the case, but not so with God, Matthew 10, 30. And um, that should be a source of comfort. I don't know why it wouldn't be if the whole world doesn't understand your plight because you love the Lord and keep his commandments and you're being tempted and persecuted and all that because you love the Lord and keep his commandments. Well, God, and uh, God knows himself. That sounds strange, but that needs to be said. Uh, the one God knows himself, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. And also 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. 2 Timothy 2, verses 12 through 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, concerning God knows himself, is Paul reasoning as to how we have the mind of God in words in the Bible because God's the only one that can reveal himself. And the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is the revealer. And he, by miracles on earth, seen by men, confirmed that that word is from heaven and not from men. So the Holy Spirit's the logical revealer of the mind of God. Why? Because he is God. And then he talks about each one of us. Well, logically, and in reality, any one of us are the only ones that can truly reveal our mind. And so if we can understand that on our level, then we know that the omniscience of God means he knows himself. And thus, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God reveals God. There are a lot of things that could be added to this list, but since we didn't give as much time to it as I guess we should have here a couple of weeks ago and even last week, I think this is a pretty good sampling of those things that uh, had to do with the omniscience of God. And I will see if we can say a few more things. I had a quote here from from a fellow, and I don't know where I can lay my hands on it right now. If I can, I'll just leave it alone, use it some other time. But uh, it's important for us not to get the idea, let me put it this way, that uh, God can uh, do things that are nonsensical. God is sometimes, somebody says, well, concerning the power of God, the omnipotence of God. They may say, well, can he, can he make a rock that's too heavy for him to lift? That's a nonsense thing. God can do anything there is to be done that is consistent and flows from his eternal essence. But that doesn't mean that nonsensical things flows from his eternal essence. Nonsense is nonsense, whether it pertains to God or pertains to us. And that's a point that needs to be kept in mind when it comes to those things. Now, last week, when we were doing some questions, I brought up the idea of God's divine omniscience and our human freedom, our free will. Because uh, I want to emphasize this again going to get into the class this week, that God's knowledge of all things and thus his knowledge of us as, as free moral agents does not handicap, hinder, or hinder our free choice. He just knows what we'll do. I didn't think about this last week, but I thought about it later. Even uh, we can know things people are going to do under given circumstances by being eternal in our attributes. We have human attributes. You could be in a position on earth. Let's say you're up on top of a mountain and you're looking down. It doesn't have to be a big mountain, just where there's a highway that's going around that mountain. And let's suppose that there's one car going one way and one car going another. And it's a one-lane road. Neither car can see one another. You can see both of them. 
And you know if they stay going toward one another in that one lane road, that if one or the other doesn't stop or run off the road, they're going to run into one another. And you know that before it ever happens. Well, if we in the limited sphere has nothing to do with what God is, can see things that way, and yet the people driving those cars are perfectly free. Stop, back up, or whatever they want to do. But we knew if they continued to go the way they were going, that they, when they got within sight of one another due to the curve or two of the road, they weren't going to be able to do anything but run into one another or Maybe you were off the road. You knew there were going to be an accident. Well, that's just by our logical human limitations in thinking. So if I can understand that, I can understand how God who knows all that's the object of knowledge and create a free moral agent, know him thoroughly, yet he still chooses the direction he's going to go. But God knows what direction it's going to be. But it doesn't handicap my choice. Um, again, I'll remind you along that line of God knowing Abraham, God knowing uh, Pharaoh, the Exodus, he knew them. Now, what gets interesting is that, you know, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Sometimes study that for a while, and you'll see the scripture says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, God hardened his heart, and his heart was hardened. Well, hardening of heart there means a disposition of mind that's too stubborn to follow the evidence that says that the plagues Moses worked by the power of God, which were miracles, said you better do what Moses says. But he wouldn't, and therefore his heart was hardened. Well, consider for a moment. God will say in dealing with Pharaoh that I raised him up so that these things would happen. Well, does that mean Pharaoh didn't have a choice? No. It just means that God, knowing all that's the object of knowledge, knew everything there is about Pharaoh and knew that the caliber of person he was, he was going to act the way he acted. And so Pharaoh made his free choices and God knew he would. Now, when you think of God's providence as it comes down through thousands of years from the beginning until whenever the end comes in time and space and material things. Remember, none of that was something that God didn't know. That flowed out of his knowledge. That flowed out of his mind, if you will put it that way. Everything that's happening, or else how could he say, uh, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Think about all the human beings that lived on this earth. If the world lasts 100 years or 1,000 years or whether it lasts next week, there's no way for us to comprehend how many hairs that is. Yet God knows every one of them. That's rather amazing. And whatever else is knowable, he knows it. So he doesn't come to know anything. Thus, we, that ought to make us more, uh, I guess you'd say, determined than ever. The whole two is we sing the song sometimes. God's unchanging hand. That's a very important point to keep in mind. Now, if you have any questions along this line, um, go ahead and jot them down, and we'll look at them more later. But I want to go back to where we left off in our part last week. We were talking about the holiness of God. And we pointed out that because he is holy and man's to be holy, and man's uh, responsibility is anchored in who God is. That's why I wanted to study this with those who were that interested, because that's what we're doing, is studying what or who God is trying to make sure that in our limited, finite, weak minds, regardless of how high our cues might be, that we don't confuse God with man. And remember, we are commanded to be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy, Leviticus 19.2, and 
also in 1 Peter 1.16. The idea of being perfect, just as your uh, Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. How is that possible? Well, because there's a scheme of redemption. There is a plan God has made, as we know, as the gospel. And by compliance from the heart with the gospel, then we stand before God, cleansed by the blood of Christ, made holy. Uh, no one can do that except by such a faith in God in Christ that it leads us to comply with his will from the heart. So sin, therefore, though it's the breaking of the law, is in reality a more profoundly stated an attack upon the very person of God. See, we just have a hard time realizing why is sin so terrible in God's eyes? Because it is act against God. Sin is properly evaluated when it's compared then to the holiness of God. It seemed to be really what it is. And that helps us better understand why God's prepared a place like hell for those who reject God, reject the Christ, reject the gospel, who won't live by it, who refuse to repent, and so on, and die in rebellion to God. You're in rebellion to the one, the true and living God who is holy. You're, you're rebelling against his mercy, his grace, and his love, and his knowledge, and his power. All that is God, when you sin, you rebel against him. So, sin is seen to be what it really is when God is seen to be what, I should say, who he really is. I guess what he really is goes along there, too. The sinfulness of sin is quite apparent when we concentrate on the holiness of the one divine essence or deity of the Godhead. Sin is sin because God is holy. Well, sin is that which is inconsistent and incomplete compatible with all we've been studying from the scriptures, God to be. And of course, because of all this, man should flee sin, as the Bible teaches, and do all we can to pursue holiness as the Bible prescribes it. Notice we're not told to be omnipotent or omniscient or immutable. We're not told to be that. If God had told us to be that, that would have been an impossibility and been contrary to the very essence of God and his nature anyway. However, we are instructed through the scriptures and without any equivocation to be holy. It's just plain language. Be holy, for I'm holy. So this is the only attribute that we are commanded to emulate. Now think about that for a minute. Being holy as he is holy. And in that way, God is honored. Think of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 that we are to be perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, once you become a Christian, you've obeyed the plan of salvation and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, the Lord's added to his church, his spiritual body, his family. We have but one thing to do, perfect holiness in the fear of God. In Psalm 97, in verse 10, Psalm 97 and verse 10, you can see him saying that those of you who love the Lord hate evil. How can you perfect holiness, the fear of God, and not hate evil? Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. ASV 1901, John 14, verse 15 that the uh, whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his command. There's no way you can 
try or even attempt to be holy as God has commanded us to be, even as he's holy, and ought to have the proper disposition of mind toward the truth of God that was given from God, by God, to us for our good. So not only is the individual believer to be holy, but the corporate group of believers to be holy. Now, who's that? Well, it's the church. Back under fleshly Israel, it was fleshly Israel under the Ten Commandments as they live faithful of that. So in both Testaments, you have that responsibility, our responsibility stated. Um, Exodus 19 and 6, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. Uh, you be holy, you'll be, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Remember, that was under the system of shadows and types and the law of Moses for the children of Israel. So we have the way to be holy today. Each Christian is a priest, and we offer up spiritual sacrifices as we're faithful to the Lord. Those would be the good works the New Testament joins upon every Christian. So the household of God also, the church, family of God, is to grow into a holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. So we can say we're made holy, and we are to practice holiness. Yet none of that involves just God doing everything, and us sitting down as if there's nothing for us to do. I think one of the biggest errors that the devil's ever put upon people who believe in God, the Bible, Christ, and the need of salvation is that there's nothing for humans to do in order to be saved. It's all on God's part. Seems to me just a cursory reading of the Bible to make it clear that the faith that saves has always been the faith that obeys. Hebrews 5 verse 10. Romans 6, 17, and 18. The revelation of God today is to be heard by the world in the word the church speaks, but also that revelation is to be seen in the very lives of the members of the church. So I want to terminate that further study of omniscience and especially the holiness of God that we just finished going over. Uh, noticing two passages of Scripture. First of all, the great Messianic prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 6 and verse 3. Isaiah 6, 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Again, Isaiah 6, 3. Then the last book of the Bible in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Revelation 4, 8. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That seems to be a good way to end up that part of what we're doing. God then, as time will allow, we'll get into this. God is uh, righteous. Now, some of these will stretch over. I, I can't, I think I sent this to you, and that God is righteous. If I didn't, we'll get it to you. That is, with what I gave you, or the attributes, I may not give it to you. Somebody let me know afterwards, and I'll send uh, a, several passages of Scripture, just like I did on the attributes. Uh, God is righteous. What does that mean? Well, surely, from what we've already studied, we see that that means he can do no evil, for he's not evil. He can do no evil because he's not evil. Ask the average person today who walks the street, because they never give a lot of thought to that. To give you a meaning or a definition of evil, see what you get. Or you can do that with the word, what is uh, good? Ask them, how do they know what good is? 
it's amazing, but if you really have somebody that'll think with you a little bit, it's a wonderful place to begin to study. I don't know what's evil. I don't know what's good. So you might keep that in mind when we study God's writing. The Hebrew, Tzedek, and the Greek, the Kalos, are terms for righteousness. They speak of conformity to a standard. Who do you think is our standard? Well, God is the standard. It's not outside of him, but the standard is himself. That's very, one of the very points we're trying to make in the study of the Godhead. His very essence is holy essence. He can only do right, for he is righteous. He cannot act contrary to what he is. And to put it simply, pure water flows from a pure fountain. So this has to do then with the holiness of God, really. God's righteousness speaks then of his holiness, but yet it speaks it in relationship to his creatures. His acts toward them are right. And we need to say, well, why is that the case? Because they issue from his holy nature. His nature being from his essence. What do you mean? He only does what is right. He is just in all his dealing with his creation. Pure justice is found in God because that's part of his being. I say part, lack of a better way to put it. God's holiness guarantees the rightness of his divine action. You might ask somebody sometime, when you're thinking about asking him about what evil is, what good is, what does it mean to be right? What does it mean to be right? I hear a whole lot of things nowadays, and you do too, about rights. Where does that come from? What is it to be right? So man may not understand certain deeds or acts of God, but that which man does not comprehend and that which does not make sense from his finite perspective, man leaves with God, who is holy. That's why Paul says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Well, that doesn't mean we walk without evidence. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, why does faith come by the word of God? Because it has all the evidence in it. John 20, 30, and 31. God doesn't expect us to follow him without evidence. It's adequate to prove his existence or follow the Bible blindly. So prove all things, hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5, 21. Of course, that's our obligation to do that. And he will not do for us what we can do for ourselves. So the believer walks by faith, not by sight. And to the degree that faith accepts holiness, and therefore the rightness of God's actions, to that degree, faith rests. Maybe that can tell us why we grow in faith and we have a greater trust in God and his word as time goes by. We study it more deeply, meditate on it day and night. Because true faith does not question. Faith is trust. In this case, trust in God. Who does all things well? And when you studied what we studied so far, you see why the Bible can say that. So God is right when it comes to judgment, pronouncing sentences. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 14. Daniel 9 verse 14. And uh, Romans 2 verse 5. Romans chapter 2 verse 5. It has, uh, that is, his justice has been called God's official righteousness. 
and a mode of holiness. And the psalmist, inspired of the Holy Spirit, relates the two. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, God, uh, the psalmist said. Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14. Now watch this. People cry out for justice, justice, justice. Well, righteousness guarantees justice. And justice is according to righteousness. And upon these pillars, God's throne, his sovereignty rests. And keep this in mind, all proper authority on this earth is delegated by God. That ought to be kept in mind. And though the founding fathers of the United States certainly didn't have the proper knowledge of New Testament Christianity, they understood that all authority had to be vested in God. Now, were there atheists among some of those people in infidels? Of course there were. But if you read their writings, you'll see that was the case. I don't know of a one of them in my reading studies that was a New Testament Christian. But they understood that justice had to come from somewhere. And thus, interesting that we have references made everywhere back to God. So as the one who, who is righteous and just, God is the one who will be the final ultimate judge. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, Abraham asked. Genesis 18, verse 25. Genesis 18, 25. So God will give to each man his due, Matthew 16, verse 27. Matthew 16, 27. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. And Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Revelation 20 and verse 12. That means some are going to receive punishment because he's a just God and righteous in his judgment, while others will receive rewards according to their attitude and acceptance and compliance of the will of God here on earth for the way he wants people to live, to participate, to be able to enjoy the favor of God, the grace of God that no man deserves. It's all of sin and comes to all the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. So God freely offers it to us in the great gospel, which is his power to save us, Romans 1, 16. So God is the judge. So justice will be done. There are a lot of people, I'm sure, no matter how good the human judges and juries are and so forth, that still get off and do not have to suffer for crimes they commit. That won't be the case in their judgment. And thus Psalm 73 talk, Psalm 73 talks about the wicked who at present seem to prosper. And that won't be the case in eternity after they've appeared before the bar of God's just justice because he is holy and righteous and he's omnipotent and omniscient he knows all that is the object of knowledge no secret he doesn't know so the justice of god is god's holiness actually responding to human evil and the almighty will do what is right regarding sin God's moral holiness and his ethical law demand that sin be dealt with. Cannot be otherwise. And let me give you three ideas here that you might want to consider. Just along this line. Uh, one is this 
fact that I don't have to convince anybody in this class that sin is wrong. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. There's sin of commission, there's sin of omission, John 4, 17. And that sin's attack on God's holiness and a violation of his law. In effect, it's an attack upon his right to rule. It is, in fact, the creature in rebellion against the creator. Sin is revealed really for what it is when considered in terms of the righteousness of God who is holy. The next thing, I guess it'd be your number two, sin must be punished. It's not punished. God is not just, and justice is not maintained. Sin cannot be permitted to exist indefinitely without being dealt with by the righteous judge. If it does, it brings into question the justice of God. And, of course, that would uh, challenge the omnipotence of God. Either he is good or he is incapable. And the third point is sin will be punished because God is good and capable. And in punishment, God's wrath, which is God's holy response to sin, is fully manifested. Our God is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, these, these really are three dimensions of God's justice. And thus, they provide the basis for properly interpreting what is taking place in Christ dying on our behalf. Because by his body offered in sacrifice for our sins, a body that knew no sin, though he was tempted in every point like as we are, and his blood being shed for the remission or forgiveness of our sins, his blood purchased the church, then he is atoned for our sin. When you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and you walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood continues to cleanse. The blood that was applied to you, when as a believer who repented of sins and confessed faith in Christ, you were buried with your Lord in baptism, baptized into his death, where he shed his blood. The blood is applied, rise to the water the grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ. And as you walk faithful to him, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse you and makes you holy, even as he is holy. Thus, as we are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, the blood cleanses and we're made holy, and even as, as he is holy. So God's justice is a source of comfort. That is to the faithful child of God as we live in a terribly sinful world. And, of course, that means we should draw now to God. We should spend more time in prayer and study his word and meditation on it and its application in our lives with a strong desire to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because God will ultimately rectify all wrong because he's just and he's holy. So those who are members of the Lord's church have long struggled with the fact that the wicked seem to prosper, but I, I want to emphasize they seem to prosper in their wickedness. While the one who believes in God and who's a member of the church, a child of God, citizen of the kingdom of heaven, who labors to know and live the truth, turn away from sin and embrace the truth wherever they see the need to do so, that they suffer injustice and all kind of wrong. Well, all of that's going to be taken care of because God's not governed by time. He knows when to do all of that. So without the knowledge that God in eternity will do what is right, the believer might be brought low in despair. But we shouldn't be. As we find ourselves tending to be that way, we need to understand God better. We need to know he's holy, that he knows. And he understands. In Deuteronomy 32, in verse 4, for all his ways are justice. 
a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Again, that's Deuteronomy 32, 4. I think that's where we'll begin uh, in the class tonight. And if you have any questions again, feel free to write them down. Let me know, or we want to ask some questions after class is over. As we call class to an end for tonight, we thank you for being with us.